uh, we'll go right to the scripture. The, the message today is the desirability of the gospel. Our Guatemala team is out, and I wanted to kind of share in the missions and evangelism a great calling. So let's all look at Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 27. Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 27. I will read the first. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have come about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. Everybody, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. In today's scripture, Paul is going to Jerusalem. His future is uncertain and he knows that he's going to suffer tremendously. And he's addressing the elders at Ephesus for what probably is going to be his last time. He summarizes his calling and his ultimate goal and desire. He sums it up. In verse 24, if you could have that again. He says this. Verse 24. Okay, thank you. He says this. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Only aim is to finish the race and complete the task. And what is that? The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Completing. Paul's life goal and aim is to complete the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace, which happens to be the task for every one of us here today, who are true Christians, the Great Commission. The gospel is the good news. The good news of God's grace is in fact the greatest news that the humanity has ever heard. Because it brings salvation to the already condemned. Because it gives hope to the hopeless. Because it brings completeness to the void in our hearts. Because it is the news that the Almighty God Love his creation so much that he died for their sins and established a way for his creation to come to him and become his children. It is an invitation from God to every one of us to be with him. Thus, the greatest news the humanity has ever heard. However, the reality is the world does not regard the gospel as good news. For the world of gospel is neither good nor in, or is it even used anymore. This is the challenge of every Christian today. This is the challenge for every one of us sitting here today. How can we complete the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace to a generation that doesn't want it, to a generation that doesn't desire it. Today I want to share with you how we can do that and how we should do that. So what's the problem? What's going on? What's wrong? 
But we seem to be at a time in our cultural history when people no longer care about God. When people no longer care about God. Where postmodernism stimulates a philosophical stance devoid of truth, meaning, and certainty. Where people desire to remove all ultimate references and devoid any truth, meaning, or certainty. Where people value feelings and not truth anymore. Today, people do not desire the gospel mainly because one of two reasons. One, they believe that God, truth, meaning, and is irrelevant to their lives. They said, I don't know, and I don't care. That's the first. The second is this. There's people who don't want to hear the gospel because it actually may be true. They don't want to know. They say, I don't know, and I really don't want to know. This is the two prevalent, I mean, there's other positions, but these two are the most common that I've experienced. So let's talk about the first one. What do you say to those who say, I don't know, and I don't care? They say, Sister Carol, Sister Mia went out to evangelize, and they said, you know what? Thank you, but no thank you. I don't really know anything about God, and I'm telling you, I really don't care. How do you give gospel to such people? How do you testify to God's grace to such people with such mindsets? Well, for those who think that they don't care, I believe that while they actually care, they're just not aware that they care. I think everybody cares. For all those who say that they don't care, I want to ask, if you don't care about God, or truth, or meaning, or purpose, then what do you care about? Some may say, global peace, equality, justice, tolerance, and fairness. And the others may say, oh, my family, comfort, happiness, health, security. But in caring about all these things, don't you need ultimate truth? Beyond what we just set up for ourselves? Beyond what's good for you and what's good for me? While many may feel that truth and meaning may be irrelevant to their lives, they fail to see that they, 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 they themselves demand truth for virtually every area of their life. People demand truth from their loved ones, right? I don't want my wife to. People demand truth from government, doctors, courts, news agencies, stockbrokers, teachers, even mechanics. In fact, people demand truth for almost every facet of their life that affects their money, relationships, safety, or health. To this, some may say, okay, those things are important. Those truths, I get it. But when it comes to other stuff like religion and morality, why should I care about those things? How is that relevant to my life? Well, these people who say these are probably the first ones to complain when somebody treats them unfairly, treats them immorally, discriminates against them, trumps their rights, cheats them, lies to them, and abuses them. Have you ever been wronged? I had a, my wife's uh, friend, Dongsen, came over to our house, and she's very, very, she's been wrong. Somebody said something, and that wasn't her, and she was angry. Have you ever been wrong? Did, did it matter that they wronged you like that? Everyone who has been wrong cried out for justice. All of us yearn for it. But why? What is the basis of such yearning? Where did you get the idea for the necessity of justice? If there's no ultimate standard, there will never be ultimate justice. If there's no law giver, there's no way 
to say anything is wrong. If the world depends on whatever you think is right, whatever I think is right, then who are we to judge somebody when they do something because they wanted to do it? No ultimate standard, no ultimate justice. People have gotten away with it all this time, and people will continue to get away with it. Whether they believe it or not, whether they realize it or not, the question of God and the ultimate truth is a vital part of everyone's lives. Did it matter that Nazis believed that Jews were inferior to the Aryan race? Was it relevant when people flew planes into buildings, detonated bombs during a marathon, beheaded innocent lives? Did it matter? Of course it matters. It matters now. It mattered back then, and it will always matter. In 1952, Encyclopedia Britannica published the great books of the Western world, it's a 54 volume set. The editor covered 102 great ideas, including democracy, desire, family, government, happiness, history, justice, law, life and death, love, man, philosophy, science, wisdom, and so on. The editor-in-chief, Mortimer Adler, wrote an introduction to these great ideas in two volume set. When he summarized the thoughts of all the great thinkers like Socrates, Plato, or you know, everybody, out of all these ideas, the longest section was given to the topic of God. When in an interview with Larry King, he was asked, why did you give the theme of God the greatest volume of space in your multiple volume set? And he replied this, because more consequence for life follows from the one issue than any other issue you can think of. In other words, how you view God has the most direct and exhaustive bearing on what else you believe and how you live. God matters in our life. In our current society, we put so much importance on personal development and social tolerance and acceptability, we ignore the most important matter of essence. C.S. Lewis put it this way, when a ship goes out into high seas, it has to answer three questions. Question number one, how do you keep the ship from sinking? It's a personal ethics. Number two, how do you keep the ship from bumping into other ships? Social ethics. But the greatest question, why is the ship out there in the first place? This world doesn't know. The essential ethics they cannot answer. Without God, the most important question can never be answered. For all the people who say, I don't know and I don't care, we need to plead with them that they need to care. We need to convince them that they already care. They're just not aware that, that they care about it yet. We need to convince them that God is relevant in their lives. In fact, without God, everything else that they consider relevant will lose their relevancy. Everything else that they consider relevant in their life right now, it's going to lose their relevancy. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so everybody departs. What good is, good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? When we stand before God in judgment, in the nakedness of our soul, we will discover that the only relevant thing is our relationship with God. That's the only relevant thing when we're standing before the judgment seat. Naked as we came. This is the gospel you are called to testify to. Are you able to do it? Are you able to testify to this good news? Number two mindset. I don't know and I don't want to know. There are people who are scared. They don't want to hear about God in fear that it might actually be true. That once they determine it to be true, they're obligated now to follow all of the rules and regulations in the Bible. That 
they'll be giving up their freedom and happiness. These are people who believe that in order to be happy and fulfilled, they must avoid God and His moral law at all costs. Otherwise, I'm going to lose my happiness. They think that if they can just break free from God and His law, that they're going to be happy. What they fail to realize is that it is impossible to break free from God or His law. Let's suppose you want to break the law of gravity. Can you do it? You go up to the top of the building. You put on a red cape. You put a big S in front of your shirt. You put a, a red underwear over your pants and you jump off. Can you break the law of gravity? What will you be breaking? What will you be breaking? You will be breaking yourself while proving the law in the very process, right? You will be breaking yourself while proving the law. When you jump off the building, just because you don't think about the law of gravity, does not make the reality of gravity go away. Just because you don't think about God, it does not make the reality of God go away either. You see, whenever you try to break God's moral law, you end up breaking yourself while proving God's love in the process, whether you want to believe it or not. Every time we break God's moral law, we get hurt. I want to read the uh, Bible, Isaiah chapter 1. What happens to people who try to break free from God's law? Can we get uh, Isaiah chapter 1? I think it's still there. Okay. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the law. They have spawned the holy ones of Israel and turned their backs on it. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart is afflicted. From the sore of your feet to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and wells, open sores, not clean bondage or soothed with oil. What is God's tone here? Is God angry with these people? Is God in a state of wrath? Is he judging them? No. What I hear is God who is pleading with his people. Why are you doing this to yourself? Stop. You're hurting yourself. Why are you doing this? God is pleading with them. God is pleading with us. He's pleading with me and he's pleading with you. God is saying your disobedience is hurting you. Stop. What are the things that you are doing to yourself right now? In your life, how you live. What are the things that you are doing to yourself right now? You are doing them because you believe that they will make you happy. But don't you realize that in reality, they're in the process of breaking you. Bible calls this bondage. Spiritual bondage. Being imprisoned in a cage, unable to break free. Thinking that somehow you know better than God about what is good for you. What will actually make you happy? All of us sitting here are sitting here because we know ourselves, right? We are not good people. We are sinful people. God knows the secret things in our heart that we think nobody else knows. He knows. I know. He sees the brokenness that ensues. Not only have we broken His law and broken our lives, we also read that it has broken God's heart. Even as we turn our backs on God, or our own way, begin destroying ourselves and everything around us, God weeps for us. He desperately wants us to stop breaking ourselves and go back to Him. And so God so loved the world that He gave it one and only Son. 
for broken people who had broken his law and is now living in broken lives. And before Jesus Christ went to the cross, he broke the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. God came into this world and he took the brokenness, the pain of all we had done to ourselves and he was broken for us. But he didn't stop there. On the third day he rose from the dead. He conquered over death and pain and shame and now comes to a broken people and said, let me heal you. Let me make you whole. Let me mend you. Let me complete you. This is the gospel we are called to testify to. Are you able to testify to this gospel? This is the greatest news. Today's core message is this. The gospel is not about the existence of God but rather it is about the desirability of God. Do you understand the difference? When we are giving the gospel, when we are testifying to the gospel, we are not trying to convince people that God exists, but that God is good and His love is very desirable. Actually, He's the most desirable thing for all of us. That is the greatest news. We are living in a time when humanity has at last fully realized the consequences of their sin of the Garden of Eden. Humanity has declared God dead and has declared themselves to be God of their lives. They desire to define everything in their own terms. But as, we, but as pointed out by Friedrich Nietzsche in the parable of the madman, they do not realize the implication of their action. They have gotten rid of all absolutes and now they cannot define the basic things of life anymore. What does it mean to be human? What does marriage mean? What does it, what's the meaning of life? What does it mean to be truly happy? When people who cannot define who they are tries to define everything else that is around them, we end up not being able to define anything. And as you look around, this is the world we live in. We fight about the basic definitions of life because we don't know who we are. We don't know. What does it mean to be human? What's our worth? We don't know the basic things about that. And this is the challenge of all of us who are commanded to complete the task of testifying to the goodness of God's grace. How do you reach a generation that listens with its eyes and thinks with its feelings? We're supposed to look through the eyes and think with our conscience, with our heart. But we don't do that anymore. We listen with our eyes and we think with our feelings. We look at a YouTube five minute clip and we think we know the truth. How do you reach a generation like that with the gospel that we are given the task of spreading? Again, the gospel cannot just be about the existence of God, but the desirability of God. When we evangelize, we are not to just throw out any and all information about God in a haphazard way. Just, just give information about God and just hopefully okay, something will arise. We are to testify to the desirability of God so that people do not only believe His, ex his ex existence, but that they would desire to have a relationship with Him. We need to testify to God's love, His compassion, we need to testify to God's goodness and mercy. We need to testify to God's beauty and grace. Can you do that? Can we do that? You know, many atheists regard relationship with God to be oppressive. They say, relationship is a beautiful, beautiful thing if both sides surrender to each other. 
both sides sacrifice to each other. Everybody that's here, that's married, we know what they're talking about, right? If one side dictates and one side does all of the surrounding, then it's abusive relationship, right? It's that beautiful. And this is the reason why atheists like Frederick Nietzsche says that all relationship with God is exploitative and dehumanizing because they are one way. Because there's God up in heaven and says, here's the Ten Commandments, thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that, and you should obey me. And they said it's abusive. It's dehumanizing. Well, is this true? Does God oppress us? Does he dehumanize us? No. These people are mistaken about the gospel. About God's love. You see, God has already done all of the surrendering. He surrendered his almighty Godhood to be born a vulnerable human baby. He surrendered his glory to be chosen to be ridiculed, insulted, and spat at. He already surrendered his life by choosing to be bound, nailed, and crucified. He already totally surrendered himself for us while we were still sinners. And it's just now asking us to love him back. He has already done all of the surrendering. It was one way. He's just asking us to join to make it beautiful. This is the good news that we are to testify to. We have the greatest news that the world has ever heard in the person of Jesus Christ. The most beautiful, the most gracious, the most patient, the most lovely, the most desirable person in God. Can you testify to this? Before we close, I want to remind you of a warning that is implied in verse 26. If we could get verse 26. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. So the implication of this verse is that we have, if we have not completed our task of testifying to the gospel, we will not be innocent. Right? Paul has completed the race, and he's saying, I am innocent of their blood. Well, are we innocent of our people's blood around us, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, your brothers and sisters, your parents, your friends, are we innocent of their blood? We have the good news, the gospel, because Jesus shed his blood for us. If we do not complete the task, we're in a way wasting his precious blood. We dare not treat lightly the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We dare not let his sacrifice be wasted because of our either laziness or our ineffectiveness. As we close, how do we reach people who don't care? Well, we need to care about them. They might not care about themselves, but that's why God sent us. We need to care about them. But how do we do that? How do we care? Let's go to the last verse, Jude, chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. I will read this slowly. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothes stained by corrupt flesh. How are we to testify? First, we have to build ourselves up. You can't give what you don't got. You don't got it, you can't give it. You have to get it first. You know that parable about sowing, right? Spreading the seed. 
If we're throwing the seed and somebody comes and looks closely at us and notices what? We have no seed in our hand. We're just going through the action. What are you planting? Seed. 